Welcome to Hashtag Finance. I'm your host, Barrington Miller, and today I'm here with Jason Ackerman, CEO of TerraSend, listed on the Canadian Securities Exchange. Uh, Jason is joining us as part of Cannabis Week, Volume 2. We celebrated it last week, and we had such a, such a response. We have extended it to not only this week, but you can look forward to Volume 3 next week. It's turning into 520 instead of 420. Welcome to the show, Jason. Great. I like that 520. You need another reason for people to smoke. <laughs> Be- As if COVID need- wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. They need more reasons. Um, how, are, how are you doing? How's the, how's the family doing? Yeah, we're great. Great. Everyone's good up here. You know, the biggest challenge we have is uh, my senior in high school who's been accepted to college is not sure how the world's going to land up. So that's uh, not a great place for kids that age to be in that quandary. He doesn't want to take a gap year, but, you know, doing an engineering school without being in a lab and doing it online is a interesting decision you'll have to face. But, you know, than that, we're all healthy and good. Uh, so you're in New York. Where, where about in New York? Are you in the city or? Uh, I live in, I live in Soho, uh, but I'm right now up in the mountains in Woodstock, New York. Oh, okay. Um, is you everyone, everyone safe? Everyone's healthy? All of those good things? You know, physically healthy, mentally not so healthy, I would say, as a family. You know, everyone's uh, stir-crazy being at home. Yeah, um, there's a, the fuses are a little short. <laughs> fuses are short, but it's great. My 12-year-old has become an amazing cook because he's been totally participating. He goes on TikTok now, finds a 30-second recipe, and he's whipping up, you know, dinners, breakfasts, and desserts like like mad. It's quite it's quite amazing. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> um How's, how's TerraSend? How's TerraSend doing? Um, TerraSend has a special place in my heart because it's uh, just down the street from where I live, the facilities in Mississauga, Ontario. Um, how, how is the company doing during this time? Uh, really well. Uh, you know, most of our, our, our asset base is not really affected by COVID. In fact, quite the contrary. Uh, most of our Assets are in the medical market in the Northeast United States, I would say, which makes up the majority of our revenue. And uh, medical is an essential service, so people can still walk into stores with social distancing. And people are consuming more cannabis and alcohol during this time frame, so revenue is very strong. Um, a few pockets, it's weaker outside of those areas, but you know, overall, you know, very strong. What's your, what's your background when it comes to uh, getting into the cannabis space and eventually making your way into TerraSend and becoming the, the CEO. Um, you were talking earlier off camera, but on camera, <laughs> um, <but> Fresh <laughs> Direct. Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, besides being 10 years as an MA banker, which I don't tell too many people about because, uh, you know, that's a different part of my life. The last 20 years, I spent uh, building a company called Fresh Direct, which is a, a direct-to-consumer fresh food business, you know, hundreds of farms. Um, we had a million square foot manufacturing distribution. We were making our own food, kind of like a Whole Foods delivered directly to your store, directly through e-commerce. It was a $700 million business we built up, you know, from scratch over the years. Very complex business. Digital first, but lots of infrastructure and technology involved in doing it. Um, and it's a, you know, it's a really, really complex business. So I did that for a long period of time, 18 years, retired about a year and a half ago. And uh, I've always said to myself, my God, wouldn't it be easier to deliver cannabis? It's, everyone gets it delivered. Um, that's good. There's only 500 items. We've got 15,000. And trying to convince people to buy fish and produce online is a much bigger stretch than get your weed delivered. So I've always said, if they ever legalize this, that would be my next move because I know how to build scale digital businesses. Uh, so that kind of was my broad interest. And then when being a New Yorker, New York did announce that they were considering rec legalizing, I got really hyped up to say, hey, I can build a pretty massive digital presence around the New York like I'd done with Fresh Direct. And that got me interested. Besides, I'd been making investments in the space. Uh, and I figured, well, if I'm going to build my own company, I might as well run another company. So uh, I talked around, met Jay. Wild, who's uh, been in the space for a long time, had TerraSend, uh, one of the big, most active investors, runs a very substantial hedge fund, very successful uh, investor. Uh, we met and spoke, and I took over executive chairman, figuring I would you know, get to know the business and help out the team. 
and it just reminded me how much I love to build companies and build talent and, and, and run teams. And so I decided to take the full-time role because I was having too much fun. And here I am talking to you. And here we are. <laughs> on Instagram uh, so it's, it hasn't been, it hasn't been that long since you took over, I guess, officially. Um, I guess we're looking at about a month ish. Yeah. I think it's like three weeks was the title, but I really started engaging with the team uh, as the chairman in November and I went around and spent time around the country visiting with the teams, going through their plans and getting a sense of the whole business. So I would say it's really been about five months where I've absorbed the business, but technically the title's only three weeks, but that, you know, you can really think about it about five months. TerraSend has gone through a transition and we'll, we'll get to that um, as well as, uh, as well as the industry. Everyone talks about cannabis 1.0 and 2.0. And what, I guess, followers of the industry, the same thing happens with management and with companies as they evolve. And TerraSend seems to be going through the TerraSend 2.0, uh, for, for lack of a better term. Um, can you talk a little bit about the transition? TerraSend is a Canadian operator, but it's now having um, definitely a U.S. flavor. Uh, why yeah, is that? Sure. Yeah, so what Terrison began, which was an opportunity in Canada, uh, over the course of 18 months has very quickly become a company that is mostly focused on the United States, not in Canada. Um, in fact, 80 plus percent of our revenues are in the United States. So it really is a US company that's listed in Canada with a Canadian business. Um, and the evolution was a Canada business now really is a US business with a Canadian sub um, listed in the Canadian exchange. That's how you think about it. So, you know, we get lumped in a little bit with the whole Canadian situation, uh, which I will say broadly has some very challenging uh, uh, regulatory dynamics that have led to uh, a, a not very fruitful market for a lot of people uh, where the U S and certain pockets are quite different. Um, you know, we can spend time talking about that, but yeah, the, the business is not the same. And then, you know, the 2.0 management is, yeah, I did, I did come in and I've got substantial experience building company and building teams. And uh, we, uh, you know, I've gone through a full talent assessment of the company and we've got some really great people. Uh, but as I think about building a billion dollar business, there's a certain type of talent that we need. And I've, I've been running and flushing that through. And, you know, this is what I do for a living. And it's, uh, you know, that's the 2.02. You know, when I, I built my business, when I was from scratch, I was always honestly scared to death that I wasn't capable of, you know, taking it to the next level. And it really is, um, it takes a lot to move from 50 million to 100 million to 200 to 300 to 400 and have the same team be capable of doing those levels. And I've been through that cycle before. So, you know, that's what I'm doing here. Now, the outlook for 2020, uh, I guess in January, is it any different right now um, because of COVID or is three months not enough time to sort of uh, sort of make that shift? Uh, you know, internally, no. Externally, you know, we've never really told our story. We had no public. We weren't even doing calls. We weren't out there talking to analysts. So I think maybe on the external universe, things might look different. But mm -hmm. internally, it's really about solidifying the plan, creating extreme focus on where our rate of return on investments are, and then getting that story out. So not really different. And like I said, with COVID, um, we're... we're affected modestly in some of our assets, but our core revenue is not affected by COVID. But what it does create is a, excuse my friends, a shitstorm in the marketplace. And, yeah. um, you know, there's a, I've seen 10 deals come across my desk in the last, uh, you know, three weeks. So with the capital markets being in trouble, COVID happening, there's a lot of uncertainty in the market as a, as a whole. And that in itself certainly creates a, uh, opportunities and threats across the business. So I'd say that that does look different than it did, you know, a couple of months ago. What kind of, what kind of deals are you seeing coming across your desk? Good ones, bad ones. <laughs> 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 ones I'm not going to talk about live yeah. right now. <laughs> well, you know, look, like anything else, you know, the, the, the one way to look at this industry is that it's being built. You know, most industries are already built. They're not young. This requires you know, you got to build cultivation, you got to build manufacturing, you got to build retail that takes capital. This industry is in the early phase of constructing itself. 
one way to think about it is, is you make a bunch of commitments to start doing this and you assume that the runway of capital will continue to come to roll your plan. Well, if the musical, the music stops and you don't can sit on your chair and you don't have enough money to fill the plan, you're, you're in trouble. You got, you're kind of, you know, holding the hot potato. So there are good companies that have really got caught on the capital cycle there and bad companies who shouldn't have been where they are. So there's, there's a lot of that disruption. The key thing at the end of the day, which there isn't always that discipline, you can't bet the capital is plentiful and forever. You have yeah. to make sure that you can, you have runways within your own capital base to execute and make cash flow and do that. So people just were too extended and didn't anticipate what is a rational probability, which is stuff falls apart. And that, that's a lot of for people that are just joining us or tuning in late, I'm here with Jason Ackerman, CEO of TerraSend. You can catch this interview uh, after we're done for the next 24 hours on Instagram. And afterwards, it'll be available on YouTube under CSC underscore TV. We just hit 500 subscribers. Let's get to 1,000. Mm -hmm. As well, uh, www.thecsc.com. You can check out our blog. And we'll be here all week. So <laughs> you're all caught up. Uh, some of the products and brands that Terrasend has, um, mm -hmm. what are you, uh, what are you selling? Uh, well, there's four stacks of brands I talk about. So in Canada, we're a manufacturer. We've got the Haven Street, which is a, a middle to premium product where we've got everything from 1.0 to 2.0 products distributed in most of the provinces in Canada. Um, can't cross borders, right? So U.S. and then U.S. I think about in three buckets. We're very big in the medical market, so we have a very uh, uh, science-based product lines around 70 products that we manufacture uh, besides the flower and the grow uh, from what you consider to be the full line of products you find in a dispensary end-to-end. -end. Uh, we've got a great manufacturing team, and that covers our East Coast medical group. And then out in the West Coast, it's not medical. You know, it's flavors and fun and surfing and, you know, <laughs> efficacy and let's get wasted. You know, it's a whole different market. So... You know, we've got manufacturing out in California that's uh, much more in line with, you know, the fun side of, of consumables. Uh, we have a high-end grow, uh, state flower, which is a very high concentration, very, very above grade A, you know, premium small, kind of like craft growing. And uh, Valhalla, where we have uh, gummies and uh, we're coming out with our chocolate line and some other stuff. And then we have our CBD business, Funky Farms and Original Hemp, which we distribute around the country uh, in vape stores, CBD stores, and, and, uh, and other places. Let's, let's continue uh, in the United States. Where, what attracts you? Uh, if you're looking at where you would expand or your dream states to enter, what's, uh, what do you look for? What's your criteria? Uh, yeah, the, the simplest way to break this down, and, you know, I was an outsider to this industry, and it was, you know, you look at it, and the, the structure is pretty simple to figure out. So the world works with an equilibrium between supply and demand creates a good market. So what I mean by that is that supply is growing, demand is retail presence. At the end of the day, you can't sell cannabis if you don't have retail stores for people to walk into to buy or also go to the black market or, or the, whatever your listed market. So retail must develop supply, demand supply being growing and supplying. So what happened in Canada is uh, not enough stores got opened up. Canada is largely 2000 stores understored, but all of the growing as if those stores were open happened. So too much supply, not enough demand, bam, prices tank. Everyone has excess pot everywhere. There's literally seven times the amount of uh, cannabis grown than there is sales because of the lack of dispensaries. And so the market's tanking, the prices are down. It's just a, honestly, it's a wreck. And so when you look at how to make money in this thing, it's not about whether can you make money in Canada this, it's whether the, the, the rationality of the regulatory environment at the state level and at the uh, uh, municipality level is set up in a structure so that there's a balance in supply. And if that happens, then prices are rational and you can make a margin. And so in other states where we are playing, for example, in Pennsylvania and New Jersey, there, if you match up the dispensary square footage and the canopy square footage, they're at the right ratio. So the amount that's grown is the amount that's consumed. So prices are healthy, margins are healthy. You can make a great return on investment. So those are, the, when you say, where do we play? You gotta play in states that the economics are such because the regulars, they can really screw this stuff up, honestly. And they, yeah, it's yeah, amazing. We've, we've noticed. 
you know, but when the regulars don't screw it up and it moves along, it's, it's beautiful. So when you say, where do we play? We play in those beautiful places and we try not to play in those not so beautiful places. Oh, wow. Um, Common sense. And that, yeah. Uh, which takes me to banking versus legalization. This is a question ah. we have been posing to many a CEO. And what's your wish list? I am not wishing for legalization. I am wishing for banking act and the descheduling from drug from schedule one to schedule two. That's what I want. I think actually federal legalization isn't the most critical thing to happen. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, first of all, when you look at it right now, states are investing in full supply chain, growing manufacturing and dispensing. Those states are making money from those three elements. If we federally legalize and all of a sudden all the growing flies out to California because the sun's shining all the time and then Pennsylvania right. loses that revenue, they're going to be like, hold up. Even if we're federally legal, we're not going to allow importing. So there's a lot of reasons why the states may not want to undo their investment in the federal legalization. And even players like us, the guys who are going to win is where the sun is shining all the time. So it's a plus minus in federal. But there's three big issues. Cost of capital is super high because we can't get banks to play. Right. So we have an abnormally high cost of capital that affects right. our rates of returns. Big problem. Two is banks can't do merchant processing. So credit cards, seven, eight, nine points and expenses makes the business impossible. Customers can't use credit cards. Big part of the transactions. That's a problem that will go away with the Banking Act. And lastly is uh, federal 280E taxes in the United States. They, they basically tax at gross profit, not income. And that's because of basically in the 50s, when they wanted to put to, you know, to bed you know, the drug families out in Chicago. And the only way they can get them was tax evasion. And if they basically said the rules, you can't deduct expenses, they all went to jail on tax evasion. They never got put away for murder. So they, so pot is a schedule one drug. So the taxes are wickedly inefficient. So if we deschedule it, then the taxes make us more efficient on our use of capital. Those three things are what I wish for. Federal legalization, I could take or leave. Well, I wish I, I wish I had a scoreboard um, because there's uh, many people have, you know, been arguing uh, arguing differently for those for those points. But um, yours is very very sound and and makes total sense. Do you do you see any of that happening soon? You know, there's been some positive and negatives on the Banking Act. You know, I've heard some recent positive moves. Mitch McConnell, you know, is, is, is just outright against marijuana. So he said that he's going to blank. The, the, the Banking Act passed the uh, first step, but, but Mitch basically says, I'm going to knock this out if it comes to my desk. You know, with COVID and, and all these other things, you know, might be a different tune. So I've heard at the legislative level that they are having maybe a different set of conversations. So they're going to give it another go. It's really hard to know. But, you know, the truth is, if you talk to Chase, Bank of America, like these big players, they want to play in cannabis. So the banks want this. It's really the legislators uh, on this. So there's a lot of support, but we got to figure out how to get it past, uh, you know, that. And maybe when Mitch is gone, maybe he'll leave with the Trump administration who's there. I don't want to talk politics, but uh, no, no, no. maybe no. that'll help. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you're tuning in and you like the conversation, this can be found on Instagram afterwards for the next 24 hours and we will be dropping it on hashtag finance we did a podcast and a lot of the similar conversations that we're having here um we had elsewhere so uh tune in <laughs> like i said subscribe uh, to cset underscore tv you have some special relationships i want to talk about canopy or i want you to talk about canopy <laughs> um where are you at with them and how how did they get into the fold? Uh, yeah, so they were an early investor with JW uh, in participating in acquiring the original Terrace and Mississauga uh, asset when it was a startup, and they participated then in Canada. When we pivoted to invest in the U.S., as you know, Canopy, as a public TSA company, cannot invest in THC in the United States. Um, but Canopy has said, uh, you know, that when we federally legalize, they have a strong desire to be in the United States as well. So they've been out there, as you know, uh, investing in companies in a, in a compliant way to uh, allow them to participate in the future in the U.S. market. Um, so they, they look at TerraSend and others as a way to when we federally legalize for them to have a deeper relationship and a head start to growing the United States. So that's how they see it. 
Um, so they've invested $60 million uh, recently in TerraSend, which we kept some money in Canada and we used to pay down debt, not to invest in THC uh, for our business. Uh, they're a decent shareholder. And, um, you know, they're a great group. You know, they're one of the biggest in the business. They know what they're doing. Uh, we spent a lot of time chatting with them on strategy. And, uh, you know, we see them as a pretty important capital partner uh, of ours right now. They're great guys. Oh, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, where are we going to go? Uh, your leadership. What's Has anything changed during COVID? Has anything changed as far as your style? Uh, have you things you'll take away? Things you'll... Well, you know, I love a good crisis. It teaches you so much, <laughs> I swear. And let me tell you, I've been through some really hairy-ass crises, really. Um, I'll give you an example. When I was running Fresh Direct, I don't know if you remember yeah. something called Super, Superstorm Sandy. It's when New York yeah, got, got hit with a flooded New York, literally flooded New York. So I'm an online business, and all my trucks sit in New York, were by the water, oh. and Sandy hit, and 200 of my vehicles went underwater. The power goes out in the Northeast, and I've got an online business with $75 million of payroll, and I, my revenue went from like $600 million to zero overnight. Uh, so I've been here. I've dealt with this before. Um, so, you know, this isn't a crisis, like this is a crisis, but it's just another, it's just another thing. But what I love about a crisis is that it really teaches you about your people. Uh, it's like an, it's like amplifying uh, the sound of someone's capabilities because how they perform in a crisis really shows you what they've got in their guts, their natural instincts, their, their, whether they're true leaders or not leaders or whether, you know, they panic or have clarity, whether they could stand in front of people who are, you know, scared, you know, are we going out of business? What does it mean? We've got to shut our doors, the health, the wellness, the communication, all that stuff shows up, gives you a great chance to see how your team performs, gives you really good insights into it. So, you know, it's, uh, it's like getting a little how's spice to the, to the meal. So it's good. <laughs> how's your how is your team performing? Good, good. Some, some no surprises of some talent that I kind of had a high degree of confidence in that are really performing well. Uh, a few people that uh, surprise me. Um, some people who just, you know, we've got one gentleman who runs uh, the stores out in Apothecary, and I swear to God, he lives at the stores. He's so focused on taking care of his employees and doing the right thing. Just all guts, all in there every day, in the field, exposing himself to make sure that the employees we're done right. Everything was set up. You know, you just see this heart that goes into it. It's just like, yeah, this guy, you know, wow. he, he, he bleeds the business. You got to love people like that. So yeah, some great stuff has come out of it. And then, you know, there's stories on the other sides, but you know, that teaches you something too. Right. Uh, customers and attracting new customers. Um, how do you go about it? How do you go about keeping the ones you have and building the business and getting new ones during this time? Uh, yeah, well, look, like this time or not time, keeping customers is about execution. You know, right. you, could, you can never have a product that you got to pay customers to keep in the door that never works economically. So, you know, you know, our core values, one of them actually is customer obsession, no different than Amazon. My whole life, I built it that way. So you have to constantly ask your questions. How do you know your customers are happy? You're satisfying them. So that's how you keep customers. And you got to understand how you do that. Um, for us, it's a lot about the retail experience. It's the, the, the values that we kind of exude, the training that we give our employees and the efficacy of our products just have to be top of market. You know, that's just a necessity of this is, this is not new to cannabis, this is business. So you got to do that. And in this environment, you know, you've got to adapt. So I give an example in Pennsylvania, you know, we immediately had a very strong curbside pickup. We opened up a drive-through window at our dispensary so people don't even have to get out of the car. They drive in, beep, beep, letter, come right out to your car, drop it in like a McDonald's or Starbucks. So, you know, you're, you're just trying to adapt quickly so that there, we've gotten really a lot of kudos around making sure in this COVID environment in the stores that do they feel safe? Does it feel like it's a, you know, an environment that we're adapting, we're doing the right things? And do they still have a great experience? And we've done that in our revenue and dispensaries and, you know, Pennsylvania have been killing it. Wow, that's that's amazing, and uh, kudos to you and the Terrasen team for it's the team, continuing man. to yeah continuing to service the clients and um, and the customers. What's on the horizon for Terrasen? What does I'm going to say the rest of 2020, 2021? Um, what's out there? 
Uh, well, you know, we have a plan. The plan is our plan. It's been our plan. We're sticking to it. Uh, so if we look at where we're investing our capital, uh, we just tripled the size of our cultivation and manufacturing in Pennsylvania that came online in March. It's now full swing the second quarter. So we're, you know, tripled the business there and that's, that's on fire and moving, moving forward. Um, uh, we're opening up two dispensaries in Pennsylvania. So that's happening. Uh, we're constructing 150,000 square feet of cultivation and manufacturing in New Jersey as we speak. So we're, we're building that and that'll be done in the fourth quarter this year and we'll be in business uh, early next year, just like Pennsylvania. So we're running hard building the team uh, out in New Jersey. We've got dispensaries in California that we're under construction in and we're expanding our, 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 our grow and our manufacturing. We're coming out with a new chocolate line you know, shortly. And uh, we're launching 20 new products in our CBD business. And uh, yeah, there's a lot going on, but that's all part of our plan. And that's our, that's what we're focused on. Wow. No, that's awesome. Uh, for the people watching and listening, we've disabled the comments uh, simply because we would get too many and wouldn't be able to answer them in a timely fashion. But that does not mean uh, we do not want to hear from you. Uh, if people want to reach you or reach Terrace and what should they do? I don't even know. That's a really good, that's a really go good the, question. Go the, yeah, go to the website, I guess. Here's my cell phone number. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'll be, you people... know, I'll be, I'll be honestly, I don't even think we have a way for that to happen. Our, webs, our website stinks, honestly. You know, the corporate website to kind of take on that stuff. I got, I'm in the middle of redoing that one, so don't, oh, don't okay. bother going there. <laughs> we'll get that fixed, though. Uh, um, in the meantime, people can go to uh, the CSC.com um, send me an email. Uh, actually, there's tons of uh, places on our website that you can send emails to as well. Like I said, uh, check out Canadian Securities Exchange on Instagram, CSE TV. We'd love to hear from you. Love to hear your comments. Uh, tell us, tell us one thing that we don't know about you. I'm a mean ass blues guitar player. No. Oh yeah, baby. How'd you, when'd you learn? How long have you been playing? I'm 52. I've been playing since I'm 12. I got 40 years of playing. Uh, so I, I played in bands when I was uh, all the way through college. I was going to be a ski instructor in Colorado, play guitar in a bar and go skiing. And that was my life ambition. Landed up going to Wall Street, but I still play my guitar. I've raised all my children to be musicians. My two sons, piano, bass, guitar. My daughter's a drummer. And in my city, my apartment in New York City, we in the living room, right when you walk in, we've got the full band and the recording studio set up there, and we jam all the time. We, we're looking for a theme song for <laughs> uh, Hashtag Finance and for Instagram <laughs> Live. So no, I, had, I had no idea. And I, I was surprised because I didn't ask that during the, uh, <laughs> during the podcast. Oh, no, it's, that's, uh, that's it's what awesome. I do. Yeah, and I love, you know, it's funny when you have children, you know, my kids are now teenagers in, in college, and it's always a hard thing to connect, you know, how was your day at school, blah, blah, blah. But having my son play guitar, I don't have to speak like, hey, you want to jam? We go play for two hours together. We, we have a way to connect that's outside of the whole parent-son kind of relationship. And thank God, when he was 12, I bought him a record player, and I got him three Floyd albums, three Stone albums, you know, two yeah, hotel, you know, California got him what real music sounds like and said, I'm hoping you're into this. And he came out floored, started picking up the guitar and hasn't put it away since. So little influence, but worked out. Yeah, now, in a positive can, way. In a positive way, yeah. Um, I'm actually going to suggest a CEO challenge. Our CEO, uh, Richard Carlton, can play a mean ukulele. And he is a I'm going to call him a world-class skier because everybody's a world-class skier to me because I don't ski. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I, have my, I have my level two Canadian ski instructor certification. I, it, sounds, it sounds like it's big. <laughs> <laughs> right? But Canadians okay. are the best skiers in the world, and it's the hardest certification to get is Canada. That's why I went to Canada. So we've got that in common, too. I went oh, to wow. uh, Mount, Mount St. Anne's to get my certification. Wow. That's... Uh, Hopefully we can we can hit the slopes or the golf courses <laughs> sometime soon. Um, well, listen, I, I we've reached uh, we've reached the half an hour point, and I know you have uh, I know you have a very very big company to run, 
but we just wanted to say on behalf of the Canadian Securities Exchange, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for um, for being there, for being listed on us. And we wish you nothing but continued success. For our audience, again, check out CSE TV, where you can find a podcast with Jason Ackerman that we did. This will be available for 24 hours on Instagram. And if you have comments or questions, about the program or you want to get in touch with Jason, do not go to their website. <laughs> exactly. Um, I know my PR firm would be very upset with what I just said. <laughs> yeah. But this is live TV, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Um, you, can always, uh, you can always reach him via the CSE. So with that, right. I would like to say congratulations on your first Instagram live. Woo, my kids would be proud. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Jason, and have All a right. great, wonderful day. You too. All right, All right. Take, take care. care. Bye. Bye.